the trail again and again. Hiking and hunting and fishing the land. Time is time we'll spend. We'll take it to the Delta. Welcome to Mississippi Outdoors. I'm Pamela Weaver. And I'm Kevin Meacham. Thanks for joining us. In our first story, we take a look at canoeing the Mississippi River. We're headed to Bolivar County for an adventure of a lifetime. Let's go. Quapaw Canoe Company was started in 1998 with one canoe. We're on the river anywhere from 100 to 300 days a year. Uh, three full-time people and five uh, guides who come on uh, as needed. Since I was a kid, uh, I've always uh, uh, loved water and, um, and wild places. I found myself in Clarksville in the late 90s uh, twiddling my thumbs and looking for the next thing to do. And, uh, and the river called me and I have not looked back since. You guys can all pay attention. These are bench shaft paddles. So a lot of people want to use them this way, but this is the way you use them. Pay attention when you're paddling because a lot of times people flip them and they forget it's there. So you want it just like a duck foot in water from your knee to your hip. As you all know, this is the Redemption River trip uh, and we have a little quote to kick us off. And it is, Ring them bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Love that, Ooh. love that quote. So that's our theme for the week. All right, let's do it. Paddles up, here we go. All right. How I got interested in paddling was uh, born in St. Louis. My grandfather had a house that was five minutes from the Mississippi River. So I used to go out there and just stare at people who come up and down that river in motorboats. Not very many canoes, but I knew that I wanted to be on the river somehow. So as I got older, you know, me and my buddies from school started paddling the river. And, and then we kind of abandoned it, all went to college, you know, all went into business doing stuff. And next thing you know, I got a midlife crisis about when I was 44. And I decided, you know, I wanted something different. And I was going to try to find a way to get back on the river. Lay down, lay down. Lay down, girl. One day I was uh, down by the riverside. Here comes a 30-foot canoe. Never seen anything like it before. And it was built by John Rusky. We started talking. We had a good conversation. He gave me a bunch of books. Went back up to St. Louis, read them all. Walked into my occupation, retired. And here I am. Day one is always about, about meeting the other people on the trip and getting to know them. and. Uh, it seemed like this group just clicked. John Rusky is the second draw on this trip. So the first is the Mississippi, and nobody can, can compete with Old Man River. But after that, it's John Rusky. Uh, John Rusky is uh, is something out of a you know out of a mythological tale or a movie. Chris is uh, kind of like Zorba the Greek. He loves life, and he overflows with it. And uh, Everything he does is with a lot of passion and zeal. I, I, I see John as somewhat of a mentor in just how he runs his life. Um, he's, he's truly a peaceful soul and a generous soul, and I think that comes across in all that he does and, and who he is. Scott Shirey is a resident of Helena, Arkansas, but he grew up in um, New Hampshire. His father um, raised Scott going on family canoe trips and um, it, it uh, you know makes an expedition extra special when you're with family who have uh, you know a, a feeling and, and love for each other and uh, especially with the Shires since they uh, spent so much time canoeing in, in, in their family history. 
River doesn't sit down and take a break. He, he gets the job done, first to set up, first up in the morning. He's got an easy spirit too, like John. Um, you can tell how the river has sort of influenced them to flow with life as you flow with the river. He's a beaver or big fish? These creeks are very important for the spawning for all the fish. Whenever the river comes up in the spring, this is where they, uh, they swim to to breed. It's hard for them to breed out there in the current. There's no structure. Their, their eggs that get, you know, just swept away. So they come back here and lay. And then when they when, when they get a chance to hatch, man, you'll paddle back in here. It'll be like part of the Red Sea. It'll just be fish, just little baby fish, man. It's incredible. Oh man, Lark River. Uh, he makes me happy every day I see him on the river because he is so happy himself and. Uh, embodies in the purest sense um, what it is to be a river guide and a leader and uh, he does it wholeheartedly with his, in his deepest soul. We framed this trip in our minds as we wanted it to be the the Redemption River Tour 2018. Uh, when we were thinking about the trip we were thinking about all the you know, how the river always seems to flow through everything, wash things away, liberate people, free your spirit. So the idea of bonding together as a group and learning from each other in just a matter of a few days, I think that's the power of this trip and the power of the river. All right, all right, all forward together. The first thing we consider is uh, the weather, wind, and uh, river levels. You gotta evaluate your guests and see what, what they're willing to do, and then you go from there. A lot of times we'll take them into the map room and we'll give them three or four options and let them pick. That's the second piece for River. River gets a bonus. Thank you. Thank you. This is a special skipping piece. Lena is, is, a, is a skipping ex oh. expert. This oh, is for Lena. A couple paddle strokes. That should do. Eddie. Look at they still beat us. <laughs> I I first heard about John before, <clears throat> right before I moved down here in 2014. My neighbor, um, Greg, said if you're going down to Helena, you need to meet John Rusky, and uh, he'll take you out on the river, show you, show you stuff you've never seen. See further up those broader shaped leaves. Those are the the leaves of the wild grape. And it's not a muscadine, it's a tiny little grape, uh, mm -hmm. kind of shaped like, a, like the size of a pea or something. Mm -hmm. But they're very tasty. They're edible? Yeah, they are uh -huh. edible. Yeah. Are they sweet? No, they're, they're bitter, but a lot of flavor, full of flavor. <laughs> this is all considered uh, bottomland hardwood forest, they call it. Trees that don't mind water being on their roots for months at a time. In fact, they thrive in this kind of environment. Look, there's a giant um, sycamore. Oh, that's an Look original growth tree. Look at that. So the trees that were pulled out here, some of them were so big that a single section of a trunk would fill a railroad car. So I'm trying to pick the ones that look a little more lively and fresh, like this one here I wouldn't grab. These here, it's going to be pretty spotty. Ooh, but these are groovy. Check these out. A whole good stand of them there. Oh yeah, I'm taking this whole chunk. A lot of times too, it's really cool because you're not actually like, I'm not removing like, First off, they're not plants, they're fungi, but I'm not really removing like anything that's going to impact the uh, reproduction of the mushroom because the mycelium is inside the tree. It's colonized throughout the tree, that's why it's popping up all over. We had it, we had delivery. <laughs> <laughs> Take away. <laughs> look at that, doesn't that look great? Corn, onions. When we prepare for a trip, we start off with the numbers, and then we have to predict how much food each person is gonna eat per day. So you always get a little bit more than you need. And, and then usually, if you get a, a, a lot, if you, if you present a lot at the first day, people will be confident that you have food and they don't eat as much. But if you don't put enough food out the first day when people think that we're gonna be struggling a little bit, people tend to eat more because they're in survival mode. And you don't want that out there, you don't want that. 
once we deal with the food, we have the gear. You have your paddles, your life jacket, your safety ropes, chairs, tables, uh, everything you have to take with you. You have to pack it up every day and put it away, and you have to take it with you. You don't want anything that's with you that you don't use. This is gonna be our special homemade meatballs and pasta. You know, I grew up cooking with my dad. We had a big family reunion every 4th of July, and I would have to cook, you know, 50 pounds of ribs, you know, a whole pig, uh, any chickens, everything. I'm used to cooking a lot of food, big portions for long periods of time. And over the years, you get that patience with it. So it's more like a, it's a feel, it's a sound. You know, you can't say it's gonna be ready in 15 minutes before you start. It depends on your fire, how fast it's cooking. All that stuff is very important. And I think I've gotten to the point where I just enjoy it, man. Especially cooking over a fire. That is the best way to cook is over an open fire, man. You can't beat it. Inside, it just feels um, harmonious. It feels right. Uh, like everything's at the right tempo, at the right um, pace. And it lets you get into the state of mind uh, that I don't think we get to encounter very much these days, where you can just relax. You can just let your mind go and focus on small, quiet wonders. It's gorgeous. Everybody used to always enjoy going out and camping and stuff like that. Now it's gotten so much, it's gotten so much easier for people just to go places for a day or so without having to work to get there. One thing about canoeing, you have to work to get there, and that's the, that's the joy of it, you know, your accomplishments. For over 70 years, Mississippi Outdoors Magazine has served the readers of the Magnolia State. The magazine contains interesting features such as wildlife photography and solar lunar tables. Subscriptions to the magazine are very inexpensive, and when you subscribe, you'll receive six bi-monthly issues containing articles on hunting and fishing in the state, public lakes, state parks, and our wildlife management areas. For more information, call our toll-free number at 1-888-874 Five seven eight five. The journey down the Mississippi River continues, taking four days and three nights to complete. Our travelers reached their destination in Greenville, paddling over 70 miles on the Mississippi River. camped, uh, there's Montgomery Island, here's Big Island. We camped right here, this is the channel of the old White River. We passed Rosedale Harbor, and now we are at the Arkansas River, and we're on what's called Cat Island. I wish more people would, would uh, be able to get to see this, this beautiful, wilderness down here. We've, we've gone by some of the last, like Big Island, at some of the last big tracts of land that, that are just barely touched by man. I wish other people would, uh, more people would get to experience it and see it. Here we go, get ready. Do it, punch it. Woo. The uh, stripper canoe is built in the uh, same shape as the, uh, the Voyager canoes of the Great Lakes. In 1999, we started building big canoes, and the first big canoe was the Ladybug. And she's a 27-foot Voyager-style canoe. When we started building these boats, we built them 26 feet. And I think over the years, we found out that we needed more room to carry more gear and more food. And so we extended it three more feet to 29.6, so we could put a big cooler in the middle, a cooler the size to keep enough food for a week. In one boat, you can take 68 people, all your gear, and be out for a week. 
I always like being on the water. That's the best part for me. There, there's something cleansing about the water, something nurturing, uh, the open spaces. And then I think just in addition to that is the camaraderie. The river really does connect everyone uh, and in magical ways that doesn't always happen on land. You know, the, the Voyager canoe is the biggest, the biggest and the strongest and the most efficient democracy there is. <laughs> you know, when you're in the boat together, everybody matters. Everybody's paddle strokes matters. Everybody's the same importance and you need each other to survive. So when you go in the river with people like this all the time, you become a team and we just have that, we just have that now. And that's what makes us successful. <laughs> you drawn, right? <laughs> I've had people who are at first nervous about getting on the water, or nervous about getting in a canoe because they'd never done that before, who uh, their, their fears are almost immediately calmed once they get in uh, the canoe, sit down, start paddling. Because the canoe, it's a whole different experience than a, uh, than a, uh, a power boat. There's no right angles on the boat. So when the water flows from the top, when it gets, by the time it gets to the back, it's pushing you along. So they're very efficient boats. They're very efficient upstream and downstream, and they can carry a lot of weight, and they're very, very sturdy. This canoe is stable. You, uh, people <laughs> have been jumping overboard and not even rocking the boat. Yes, sir! I've met Chris once before, and we've been out, but he wasn't that wild. It seems like he got, you know, he got attached to the Mississippi River and while he was gone, he's been looking forward to coming back because it seems like he was trying to take every inch of it and, and bring it all back home with him. It matches your arm. Look at that. That's cool, man. All right. That's crazy Chris Hamill. He's all the way from Vienna, Austria to do this river trip, and uh, he's enjoying life. It's great to see. Back when Twain was writing Life on the Mississippi, there's a long chapter about a, um, a settlement called Napoleon, and Napoleon was located at what was the mouth of the Arkansas at this point right here, which we'll pass today. Some early frontiers people plotted uh, a city to be built here called Napoleon. They gave it the, the ambitious name uh, of that leader. And they actually uh, started building the city and it was the most important uh, metropolis in this area of several thousand people. And then you can see what a low-lying landscape this all is. And a, uh, it started getting eaten away by the floods. Twain tells a long story about it in his life on the Mississippi. The, uh, the future dreams of those young uh, Americans uh, was eaten by the muddy waters of the Mississippi. I had no idea how wild the Mississippi area is, the, the actual floodplain and the, and the river itself. It's hard to believe that here in the middle of the US, the most developed, the richest country in the world, you got this massive wilderness just right in the middle of the country. I've been here before, Scott. I've seen some bear tracks up in there, and I turned around and ran right back to the boat. <laughs> Too fresh. Oh, really? You know how you feel like something's watching you? It's like, uh oh. Something's coming to you. Yeah, it's time to go. Today, we got to see some wildlife. We got to see some bald eagles, some pelicans, some wild boar. Um, so all of a sudden, with the right conditions, a little bit cloudy, a little rainy, all of a sudden, you, you realize you're not alone out here in the river, and it, it definitely elevates the excitement. It did for me. We're not close to nature, we're in nature. So, it, it's, uh, we've seen eagles and, and uh, a lot of pelicans, a lot of, lot of shorebirds, uh, wading birds, uh, egrets. Uh, I think I saw a white ibis, a couple of ibis yesterday. Uh, so we've seen a lot, of, a lot of interesting wildlife and a lot of sign of a lot of more wildlife like tracks and uh, beaver cuttings, things like that. We often take people that never seen the river before and they have the same reaction that we have after our first time. You know, they, they start to figure things out. They start to think about what's important 
you know, and what they want to do. They all make a different plan for when they leave the river. And it seems like it changes them because they always come back. They always bring somebody they really care about. They always bring them back. And that's the whole thing. That's what we want. There's a great line I read uh, that we need the river because it reminds us how small we are. And I think we get caught up in our day-to-day -day lives of how everything's so important. And it's, uh, it's humbling out here and it's restorative. Uh, you, you just come off the water energized and keep things in perspective. Well, I'm an artist and my art is uh, maybe what fish, maybe what um, the river is to a fisherman, you know, because probably 90% of all fishermen go to the river just to get away and get connected, you know? That's what I like best about it, is the tranquility it brings. Makes me feel whole, makes me feel like uh, I'm, where I'm, I'm, I'm at where I should be. And when I'm not on the river, I feel ill at ease. And the more days I spend off the river, the more uh, uncomfortable I get. But it doesn't have to be the biggest river in North America. You know, the sunflower will do it too. Uh, it's just that the Mississippi is wilder and it does it better. And uh, uh, I come back uh, feeling much more satisfied than I do uh, uh, from a day on a smaller river. So there is something about that big river. I think uh, this has all been very tonic. I, um, I've, I've felt uh, fitter and, and better as, as each day has gone on. The water's been great. Uh, I, I spent so much time swimming in it. Uh, and yeah, it, it's, it, it's been so nice to swim and to swim in the river. It's, it's unlike, you know, uh, any, any chlorine pool that you can swim in. It's, it's far superior, I would say. Man, that was just what the doctor ordered. For some reason, you have it all figured out once you get out there. It brings you down to your natural self. Whatever you are here, when you get there, you are the grassroots, all the, all the material things go out the window, and it's about you and nature and where you fit in and what you're here to do. And I think you start thinking more properly, but then when you get back to land and we get back to all the superficial stuff, you're right back, you know, you, you're right back confused again. So that's my thing. <laughs> it's a building block that's always changed. Every time you go out there, you got to figure it out. You get back, you go back to work. And then you got to get back out there eventually. You know, I'm, I'm nearly 70, and, and I'm not in great shape, but I'm not in terrible shape, and I can do this. You won't find a better outfit to go with. I have felt completely safe. And, and they've got a pretty good menu. Uh, I, I hadn't been hungry a bit, and we've been burning some, some carbs and some calories, I'm gonna tell you. The one thing that we think the most important thing to do with Quapaw is we want to introduce people to the river so they can have a relationship with the river, so they can take care of the river. We're very concerned with all the plastics. We're very concerned with some of the nutrient pollution. We're very concerned with stuff that, we're, so we're seeing things happen and we got to figure out what we need to, to do to make it better. Because this river has to run for the next generation, for the next generation, for the next generation. It has to. It brings like $2 trillion to our gross domestic product. I mean, a lot of people work around on the river. It transports a lot of goods, you know, from rice and corn and, and soybeans. I mean, the soybean industry, the farming industry would be a wreck if something happened to the Mississippi River. This river, you know, this is like the circulatory system of our whole country. If something happens to the river, I don't know what would happen to our country. You know, I, I always try to find some pieces of driftwood and some things to bring back home to give to those near and dear ones to me. But I think it's more the, the, the story of what's out here. The things it does to me and the way it moves me, I try to communicate that to people around me and I, I try to whip them up. So next year I'm hoping to come back with, a, with not just myself, but with a bigger crew and give uh, Rusky a few more hands on this river so that we can all enjoy it together. And maybe go to a new part of the river and keep on exploring, because I think that's a big part of the spirit. If you, if you love water and you love paddling, you have to experience this. It's, um, it is, it's not, it's not like the, the Rockies or, or coastal waters or, or mountain streams, um, and, and those are all worthy, but this is very, <clears throat> unique and, and uh, amazing thing.
I have found it very difficult to explain to someone. I think they have to experience it. You can show photos, you can tell the stories, but it's hard to, unless you experience it out here. Uh, words don't do it justice. It is truly magical. Hey, that's all the time we have for this week. Hope you enjoyed the show. Join us again next time for more exciting adventures. Until then, I'm Pamela Weaver. And I'm Kevin Meacham. See, See you outdoors. outdoors. Hunting and fish in the land. Time is time we'll spend.